All right. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for um, this lovely invitation. I'm so excited to be here. I've been in Singapore for about a day, and I'm very much enjoying it. Um, before we start, actually, I just, um, can we take a second and have everybody just stand up for a second and stretch? I cannot sit for more than an hour without moving my body a little bit, so just stretch your neck. And, oh, yes, yeah. I, take a moment. Just loosen up a little bit. Yeah, all right. Um, it's hard. It's hard to sit and pay attention for a long time, so I, I need to to move my body. Actually, let's do something else, too. Okay, all right. All right, we can have sit down. What was just happening there? What were we just doing there? It was fine. We were moving our body a little bit, get the blood flowing a little bit, right? But... Um, would anybody make the argument we were doing some playful learning right there? What, what could we have done? What, what kind of learning might have been happening right there? What, what was, any hands in the audience? What do you think? Anybody know, what, what, what do we, uh, in that interaction, what happened there that we could highlight as a learning opportunity um, for a young kiddo? Half a hand? I saw half a hand there. What do you think? Yeah, listening, responding, have a serve and return. That's like communication, right? And I didn't have to use any words. I just clapped. Like you all knew right what to do, right? We were having a call and response communication. Anything else? Beat and rhythm and timing and tempo, patterns. You all picked up seamlessly on the different patterns I was doing. So again, uh, changing our frame of what we consider learning and uh, it, it can look a lot of different ways, and there's no good reason that it shouldn't be fun and engaging and playful. And so that's kind of the theme of what um, we're going to be, I think, of the conference today and why I was invited and what we're going to be talking about. And so uh, I'm going to be sharing a couple projects from my lab. It's the STEM Learning Lab. And as you can see, we are STEM uh, because we study science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the early childhood age. But also, we care a lot about the principles from developmental science that we know promote high quality learning. And that's learning situations that are social, where kids can learn with each other and do things collaboratively, that are iterative. So uh, each time kids uh, uh, approach a learning situation, they can ask new questions and engage in that inquiry cycle and that really rich um, learning of uh, exploration and discovery. Um, learning that's engaging, so hands-on and active and minds-on, and meaningful, meaning that it's connected to things that they're interested in and passionate about, and it reflects their community and their culture and their history. And so if we can make science, technology, engineering, and mathematics learning experiences that are also social, iterative, engaged, and meaningful, we think we're going to be a re in a really strong place in creating really high-quality opportunities uh, for children, uh, which is the goal and which is why we're all here. And so I'm going to share a couple projects. Let's see, I got a couple. Oh. oh, too much. I think I maybe overclicked. It's working now. Wonderful. OK. So uh, I'm going to start by sharing some projects that are actually outside of the classroom. I know we have a classroom. We're an early childhood education group here, and we do a lot of work in the classroom. But actually, uh, a majority of young kids' time is spent outside of the classroom. There's some estimates uh, up to 80% of kids' waking hours are outside of the classroom. And so although I do a lot of work in classrooms, um, I believe in, this, in the power of school and early education uh, and being a transformative space for young kids um, and sparking passions for learning. Um, I also think there's lots of opportunities to learn outside of the classroom in the everyday spaces and routines that families hold. So um, when they're at the bus stop or the grocery store or the laundromat or uh, the schoolyard and the playground, all these spaces are ripe opportunities for play and learning and kids, um, they love to learn. If you can make learning fun and engaging for kids, they will jump right in, as you all know. The early I think in many ways the early childhood space um, has a lot to teach uh, the, the primary and secondary uh, education spaces because, um, as I'm going to highlight later, this is a more powerful way to learn, and it's more fun. So 
Uh, these are, uh, playful learning landscapes are a series of projects that my colleagues and I um, work on where we design everyday spaces, parks, bus stops, grocery stores, laundromats, um, for play and learning. And these are a variety of projects. The first one is called Parkopolis. That's a life-size board game for math and science learning that um, this was piloted at a children's museum, but we're doing one uh, in the city of Santa Ana in a public park in California where I'm from. And uh, again, all the activities are pulled from research and early education, and kids are rolling a giant dice, and they're going around um, the different spaces on this um, giant board game, and they're playing different activities that promote math and science learning. Um, this second image is from a bus stop in West Philadelphia, um, where my colleague Kathy Hirsch-Pasek, who's um, a mentor of mine, started this um, bus stop called the Urban Thinkscape, where um, we put puzzles at the bus stop, so there's like, like spinning, spinning wheels, and so while you're waiting for the bus, you can be working on your spatial skills. We know that puzzles are a really powerful tool for spatial learning in kids, which is, again, a, an important um, early math skill and is very predictive of later math outcomes. And so um, we, we designed a series of puzzles and other installations while, while families wait for the bus. Um, the last sign there is a grocery store uh, signage. And so this is at a, a grocery store, I think that's in Omaha, Nebraska. Um, but it, it invites families before they put uh, their, food, their produce uh, on the scale to weigh it. You know, you weigh, you know, if you're getting some fruit or vegetables, you weigh it on the scale and says, you know, before you put your, your uh, vegetables or fruits on the scale, make a prediction. How much do you think they weigh? And then have the kids make a prediction and then test it out. Who was the closest? And so, again, ways to promote learning opportunities in the everyday routines that are fun and exciting for kids and that they really enjoy. These are really powerful mechanisms for early learning, and we have a lot of really good research and data that these promote the kinds of conversations and interactive dialogue between caregivers and children that we know lead to learning. And um, the more we can get kids talking about math or science or new vocabulary words or social emotional skills, the more they're going to be building and bolstering those skills. Um, I got a project going in, in, uh, in Southern California uh, uh, in, a city of, in the city of Santa Ana, which is in Southern California. Uh, it's a predominantly Mexican um, immigrant city and uh, we are partnering with a group, a community organization called SALI. SALI is the Santa Ana Early Learning Initiative and we are partnering with a coalition. You can see them pictured there. It's mostly mothers, but we got like four dads, so we're excited about that. We got some dads on board, yeah. And we, had to, we work hard to get some, make, uh, to be accessible for, and also grandparents. Um, and uh, we have held a series of design workshops to create playful learning opportunities in their spaces, in their community. And the idea, is that we create it in partnership with the community. So not only does it represent best practices from developmental science and from early education, but also that community culture and wealth and, and, and funds of knowledge. So um, the strengths and the things that caregivers and families bring already, how can we build from those and build from everyday routines and practices that families already have and already engage in, and then layer in the, the learning um, again, it, whether if you're interested in math learning or science learning or vocabulary learning, it doesn't really matter. Whatever your learning goal is, you can scaffold that in through the existing routines and through play, and it becomes a joyful experience for families. Um, so we did a, a series of, of um, design sessions with families, and we had them come tell stories. Tell me a story about when you, went to the, when you go to the grocery store with your kids. That's a, a memorable story. Or when you were growing up, tell me a story about um, what it was like to go to the grocery store with your parents or grandparents. And through these stories uh, and design activities, which, some of which we'll be doing later today in the, in the workshop, so I'm excited to share some of these practices with you all, um, we've surfaced key core community values, things that parents and families really wanted to uphold and uplift through their community spaces. And so, uh, again, we did seven two-hour design sessions with families. It started in 2020, so it was, we started on Zoom because it was during COVID. But then we actually um, came together in person, and we had families come with their kids and play with the ideas and build prototypes, like little mock-ups, and um, got feedback from families about what these designs and installations could look like. 
Um, and these are some of the, the community values that surfaced. You'll notice that um, at your first you'll see uh, Spanish and then English. And that's because in the community that we're working with, it was predominantly Spanish speaking. And so we did all of our sessions and all of our work in Spanish. And then we uh, uh, translated it to English um, for some folks uh, in the community who were English speakers and not Spanish speakers. But you can see that families through their stories said that they wanted um, uh, installations that brought families together and promoted family unity, that uh, promoted intergenerational learning. So they wanted their kids to be learning from their grandparents, but also their kids to be teaching them and their, and their aunts and uncles things because sometimes young people know stuff that their elders do not know and vice versa. And so they wanted that cross um, generational dissemination of knowledge and teaching. They wanted their culture and their history represented, and that could be through flags or art or culture. Um, they wanted things that were bright and colorful. That was a really top priority. Families told us a lot that um, in the, is a, a predominantly low income community, and um, there, you know, there's a lot of stigma around their public spaces. It doesn't always feel safe and welcoming. And so just to go to your park or to your bus stop and just see something that's bright and colorful and beautiful, that's like really powerful and really meaningful, regardless of the content of it, right? And so we're going to go beyond that, just bright and colorful, but it's something that we really made a priority because the, our community partners told us that that was really important. And then, uh, again, they wanted something that felt relaxing and safe um, because that was something, not always something they could expect from their community spaces. And then uh, once we kind of um, gathered these themes from um, community, uh, about community values and, and what they wanted to get out of these installations, then we offered um, these frameworks about early learning. And so um, these principles, five principles from developmental science, again, come from many, many year, decades of research in early childhood development and education. Um, learning should be active and hands-on. It should be social. It should be iterative. It should be meaningful. You recognize those from the name of my lab, the STEM lab, and also joyful. Everything we do um, should be joyful and fun because there's no reason that learning shouldn't be joyful and fun. Um, in this project, it was funded by the National Science Foundation, which is um, the federal government in the United States. And so, uh, and they fund uh, science, uh, STEM-focused projects. And so we had a focus on early science and math uh, in this project. And so um, we took these standards from the uh, Next Generation Science Standards, which is like a science learning framework. And we really wanted to highlight in the early years that um, for, for me, what's powerful about early science is not the content of it, like, you know, biology or chemistry or physics. Um, the content, you know, is good. It's a context. But really, it's the practices and the what, what you do in science. How, how do you do science? So things like making observations, asking questions, making predictions, um, and also the cross-cutting concepts, which are things like noticing patterns and cause and effect relationships. So these are th skills that young kids can learn and build capacity that will help them learn in the future. And so if you can engage in these scientific practices, it'll, it'll give you the skills to learn new things and explore and engage in um, more inquiry uh, experiences as you, as you get older and as you develop. And so we focused on these principles of learning and our science practices and cross-cutting concepts and combine them with the community cultural values um, to, to, to create prototypes. And we had families um, draw prototypes, do arts and crafts, build things, um, and, and made it very active and hands-on. Um, and then we, you know, we've written, you know, we're researchers, and so we, we study these processes to document them so other people can replicate them. And so this is a, one of my doctoral students who wrote uh, about our process of first understanding community values and then doing a thematic analysis to surface themes from the different stories and prototypes from families. Uh, and then translate that into design ideas, and then um, develop a kind of art artifacts and prototypes, and then bring them back to families and have them play with them and test them and get more feedback, and so we engage in kind of this iterative process. Um, and then uh, another amazing doctoral student that I get to have the honor to work with um, led this paper about how we kind of balanced the different goals of um, representing people's culture and history through art and, and vibrant colors and, and uh, the cultural values like family unity and collaboration um, and uh, also connecting to like meaningful spaces. So families told us about which places in their community were meaningful and why. And so trying to lift 
up and uh, acknowledge that and combining that uh, with our own, you know, the STEM practices and cross-cutting concepts, um, as well as building off familiar experiences, so like cultural games, like uh, the, the, every culture has games that they play and these games are full of learning opportunities. And so again, combining existing uh, cultural games and practices with um, what, what we know from research and developmental science. And so I'll just show you some prototypes, some of the um, designs we have. Some of these are, exist already. And others, we are working with um, fabricators right now to build them and install them, which is supposed to happen this spring. So they're going to be coming to the world in the next couple months, which I'm very, very excited about. We've been working on these for a while now. Um, this um, is the Abacus bus stop. And so um, families told us that growing up in Mexico and other countries in South and Central America, they used the Abacus to learn math. It was a really familiar tool. And they always wondered, how come People don't use the abacus in the United States to learn math. They thought it was so intuitive and so, and so such a physical manipulative. And so we said, why not? So let's build a giant one. Let's make it colorful. And then let's put some prompts that give families ideas of things they can count where they wait for the bus. You know, look around. How many trees do you see? Or how many red cars have driven by since you've been here? Or how old are you and how old is your abuela? And how, what's, what's the difference in your age, right? And so almost limitless things. And it's very iterative because you can count new things every day you come back to the bus. So it's not like, oh, I played with this abacus. I'm done now, right? Um, this is another bus stop design, uh, a really popular game called Loteria, which is uh, it's kind of like bingo, if, if you all are familiar with bingo. But basically, um, you spin the wheel. And then you get like an icon, and we had the families and kids design the icons. And then you flip the card. These are going to be like flipping cards. And then in the back, there'll be a prompt that gives you an activity, like an early math or science learning activity um, that kids can do while they wait for the bus. And the beautiful thing about this is that um, the barrier to all these installations is that nobody's going to come to the bus and read a long uh, instructional manual. Like, I'm not going to spend 10 minutes trying to figure out how this game works. Like, you have to know and just be able to play. And by using Loteria, which the families already know, they don't need instructions. They see Loteria and they're like, all right, let's go. Like, this is my game. You know, I know how to play this. And so immediately, we, we, we built from this existing strength and this existing practice that families know and love, and then we added in the, the science and math learning content within it so that it's, again, it's organic and fun and joyful. Um, we also developed more signs for the grocery stores. Uh, so this, this um, sign is about picking your produce and why you pick the produce. So we had families tell stories about trips, tricks and tips that they learned from their grandparents and parents about how to pick the best avocado or papaya. Or, and, and, there, and what we noticed, that these stories were full of science learning. Families were using their senses. They were saying, oh, you have to feel it. And it should be a little soft, not too hard. You know, if I want to make a guacamole today, it should be very soft. But if I want it to last for like a two weeks, then it should be very firm. You know, I don't, wanna, I don't want it to go bad, right? Or, or you smell it, or you taste it, or you look for a certain color, or you pop the top off, and you see. So, Again, families are engaging all this really rich science discourse, but sometimes they don't think about this is an opportunity to invite young kids to, to join these conversations and how rich uh, that is. And so um, when we think about these science practices, they map on really beautifully um, to this exploration of produce and why you pick the produce that you pick. And so this sign is meant to invite families to engage, to invite their kids um, to, in those processes and also to build community by leaving your best tips and tricks for other families and, and for people to share ac across families and across cultures the way that they, what they look for when they're looking for their produce. Um, this sign uh, uh, is one I really love. This came from immigration stories. And so um, in the United States, we use this quirky imperial system of measurement, pounds, and uh, I'm seeing nods from uh, my New Zealand and Australia, as Australia colleague. Um, it's super weird. I don't know why we do it. Uh, but anyways, the metric system the rest of the world uses makes a lot more sense. Um, but families told us that when they immigrated to the United States from other countries, they would go to the deli and they would try to order their ham or whatever they were getting. And they wouldn't know how much to get. And they would get twice as much as they need or not nearly enough. And then come home and be like, oh, I'm supposed to cook for 10 people. And I have like not nearly enough food or way too much food, right? And so I'm sure at the time, those were just frustrating experiences. But um, 
in, in the room, you know, it was a common experience among many families, and we were able to kind of like laugh about it. But we made this sign that's going to be a slider at the deli that says that allows um, families to convert between uh, pounds and kilos when they're ordering their food. And so, not only is it a useful tool for families who are still learning this quirky measurement system we have, but also offers, offers opportunities for them to invite their kids to talk about units of measurement, systems of measurement, make predictions, and, and engage in some of this rich math learning and math talk. Um, families told us in Santa Ana that um, there's not a lot of um, public open green space. It's a very densely populated city, um, but there's a lot of walls. And so if we were going to design a game for a giant field, who's that going to help? Because they don't have a giant field to play on, right? And so how can we activate the walls in the, in the spaces that they do have in their community? And so we decided that murals could be a really powerful tool. And so um, this came from a series of ideas. Um, I, I don't know if you've ever heard of the game uh, Where's Waldo or I Spy. Yeah, these are really cool games. In, in Latin America, they have, there's one called Beo Beo. So it's kind of like a... Uh, a, a common activity where you're looking for hidden objects. And so you can see on the side there, um, these, these hidden objects, there's these green parrots that are really um, popular in Santa Ana. There's uh, butterflies, which are like a symbol of immigration. Um, there's like an Aztec symbol, like honoring some of the indigenous roots of the families. And um, so we had kids and families design this whole um, scene. And this is all set in the local community. These are local milestones and landmarks. Um, and it was really cool because um, when we had, we worked with a professional artist to make this image. Um, but when we had the first artist come back, I don't know if you've seen the Where's Waldo, but it's usually individual people walking and they're kind of facing in different orientations, which gives kind of a cool visual effect. And we came and we showed the, it had, the first draft had that kind of effect. And we showed the families and immediately they were like, no, this will not work. We were like, what do you mean? Like, what happened? We, like, we got kind of scared. And they're like, all the people are walking alone in this picture. We don't walk alone in our community. We walk together as a family. And so we went back to the artist, and we said, um, you got to put families all walking together. Right? I get like choked up because like, this, this, the families are so amazing. Um, so yeah, and you can see the mariachi band and the paleta stand. And so anyways, all these meaningful um, images, imagery from the community, but also this, this mural is going to invite kids to engage and use their skills of observation and spatial thinking and talking about above and below and underneath and behind. And so again, we're promoting rich dialogue and conversation through um, a wall that would have just been a big, ugly wall without a cool, beautiful mural on it. So um, uh, another, um, this was going to be a mural but actually is going to turn into a statue instead. But this is, um, these are local native species from Southern California or families, or, um, um, animals from families' home countries. And so uh, kids are invited to measure how tall they are compared to a mountain lion or a bear or an eagle. And we have, again, uh, we have um, centimeters and, uh, and meters and feet. Um, and then also, the animals are made of these geometric shapes, so they're looking for different shapes within the animals. So, you, so you're, you're promoting early geometry learning. Um, and, so, and also, we're building a digital app that's supposed to deepen and extend the learning at these installations. Um, and so it's kind of like a, got a Pokemon Go kind of vibe to it, where each installation has a character that lives in it, and then you scan a QR code, and then the character will come out and meet you, and you have to help it resolve its dilemma. And once you help it resolve its dilemma, then it lives in your phone, and it helps you engage in learning experiences. And so we also designed these characters um, with kids and families from our community partner, and they created these characters uh, called the Bizus. Um, and again, they're all rooted in kids' stories about what they would want from their community spaces, about who, what they would want to see in these characters. Um, and uh, the Bezos are looking really cool. Um, uh, and, and they're beautiful because they represent these core values from the community. So you can see the ant family there. Um, the, the kind of narrative behind the ant family that the kids said is um, that they're small, but, but as a group, they can lift really heavy things together as a collective. And so I thought that was such a beautiful sentiment of like a child, like I may be little, but if I work together with my friends and my family, like we can achieve stuff that's 
that's bigger than all of us. Or the, the little mole on the, on the bottom right, his name is Des. Um, his job is to help families navigate new spaces. And so again, this is a highly immigrant community. And so you can see that there's a lot of stories about coming to a space and not knowing really how to engage with it or where to go. And so um, this Bizu helps people navigate that. Um, so yeah, we're really super excited about the, about the Bizus and the kind of learning um, uh, that can happen at these installations. Um, and we're going to do a whole bunch of research to uh, to measure the impacts and study the impacts of these installations, a lot around um, uh, characterizing the language environment, how, many, uh, how much conversation is happening, and what are they talking about? Are they talking about math and science? Um, and also, are they um, promoting the, the cultural values that we design for? And so we're going to be doing some like GoPro studies where we record families engaging at these installations and doing a, like an analysis of their conversations. Um, and then we, there's this really cool data set in Santa Ana um, that every child in, in the county, in Orange County, um, takes a school readiness um, kind of evaluation when they enter kindergarten. And those data are de-identified to protect the kids' safety, but they're linked to kids' neighborhoods. And so we're going to see that if we cluster five, six, seven, eight of these installations in the same community, can we move the needle longitudinally on, on neighborhood-level school readiness? Because the idea is that if you're going to the grocery store, and then the bus stop, and then the laundromat, and then the park, and you're getting all these rich learning experiences, that that's going to be a mind shift, mind shift change for parents. And they're going to see these opportunities everywhere they go. And then bring that into the home. And when they're cooking, they're going to be talking about the math that's happening and, and measurement. And so we're hoping that uh, we can reach some kind of a saturation or tipping point where Families are, are experiencing this kind of playful learning in all of their routines, um, and that could translate to um, kind of a population, le population level data. So that this is going to be a, it's going to take a couple of years to answer this one because you got to wait for the, the things to be deeply entrenched. But it's a really exciting um, possibility, um, in my opinion. Um, and so, yeah, we have a lot of plans um, to disseminate within the city of Santa Ana, but also we're partnered with um, the Brookings Institution and with a nonprofit organization called Playful Learning Landscapes to um, share and disseminate these designs with the world. Um, and so uh, we've tried to kind of um, distill and synthesize the key um, uh, elements that we think make these designs successful and share the designs that we have. But ultimately, we think it's um, the most powerful when communities can create their own designs that really relate and engage to their um, space. And again, that's what we'll be doing this afternoon is creating some playful learning landscapes designs for here, for Singapore, for your classrooms and your families. So I'm super excited about it. Um, I'm going to uh, talk about another project too because I don't want to make it all just outside of school. So we also do a lot of work in schools. Um, and actually, I picked a project, even though this is a early childhood space, um, this, this project is actually for um, primary school students. But... Um, I think it's important to see that um, because in early childhood, like we already, there's a lot, there's a lot of, of momentum and buy-in already around play and playful learning, right? But what you hear a lot is that you know, okay, I, I'm an early, I'm a preschool teacher, I'm an early childhood teacher, I know that play is important, I play with my kids, but ultimately I need to prepare them for that next level of primary school and to be prepared to succeed in that, right? Because that's part of my job as a teacher, and so. For me, this project um, represents that primary school, secondary school, university, adults, we all learn through play and learn more effectively through play. And so this project is a really, I think, compelling example of the kind of playful learning that is really natural and intuitive in early, early childhood spaces can thrive and be really effective in primary and older spaces. And so um, many of these games can be translated down, and, and I'll show pictures of that too, but I think it's actually meaningful to show something um, in, in an older grain range. And so this is a game that we invented. Uh, it's called Fraction Ball. And so Fraction Ball is a new way to play basketball uh, that focuses on rational numbers, fractions and decimals. And if any of you know um, about math education in the primary years, fractions are the number one most difficult content. They blow kids' minds. It's so hard because it changes all the rules. Up until fractions, uh, a bigger number means more. 
Everybody knows that. That's very simple, very intuitive. In fractions, all of a sudden, a bigger denominator means you're dividing a whole into more parts. So actually, a bigger number means less. And so that's called whole number bias. And this is something that really, really is challenging for kids to learn. And a lot of times, it's because the way that we teach kids fractions in math in general is very procedural and very rote. You learn the steps. You know, you, you get the thing, and you flip it, and you butterfly, and cross multiply. and they learn these steps, and they can memorize steps, but conceptually, they never understand what they're actually doing. And so they just remember the steps and not why they're doing the steps or what they really signify. And so in Fraction Ball, we've redesigned the basketball court so that the big arc, the three-point line, usually it's worth three points, is now worth one hole. And now there's smaller arcs closer to the basket that are worth a quarter point, a half a point, three-quarters of a point. And then the left side of the court is decimal representations, and the right side is fractions. So kids can see that 1 quarter and 0.25 are the same value, just written in different notation. And then on the side of the court, there's a number line. So there's tons of research in math um, education and math cognition about number line training, and the number line being a really powerful tool for kids to understand math more conceptually and to learn uh, whole number arithmetic, but also fraction arithmetic. And so the kids um, keep track of their score on this number line, and they're embodied, and it's playful and fun. Uh, Kids are over the moon to say that, oh, in math class today, we're going to go play basketball. I know for me, that was my dream. As a fourth grader, that's all I would have wanted to do is play basketball. I love basketball. And so um, when I go to schools and I see kids playing basketball during math class, I get like so excited. Um, making fourth grade me's dream come true. So just a little quick story. I know I'm, I'm just probably going to move quickly through this, uh, this next example, uh, the fraction ball example. Um, but... So I went to um, this charter school in Santa Ana called El Sol Academy, and I actually went to them to talk about playful learning landscapes and the, some of the other designs that I showed you. And I was thinking that I would partner with the teachers there, and we would apply for a grant to try to do some learning landscapes in their schoolyard, because I thought the schoolyard could be a really cool testing zone, kind of incubator for public space installations. And so I was thinking, I had my researcher hat on, and I was thinking, OK, I'm going to get the teachers excited. And I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to get them to um, maybe uh, agree to participate, and we'll write a grant. And maybe for next year, we can, we can try something. But usually when you write a grant, it doesn't get funded on the first time. Usually you have to submit it, and then it gets rejected, and you get feedback, and then you resubmit it. So I'm thinking, like, maybe next year, but more likely, like, two years from now is when we'd, like, really do, do something meaningful. Um, and so I got the teachers all excited, and I told them, showed them Parkopolis and the grocery stores and the bus stops and everything. And they were like, this is amazing. Let's start tomorrow. What do we do first? And I was like, oh, tomorrow. OK, interesting. That is not what I was thinking. But I didn't want to, you know, I love the enthusiasm and the energy. And so I just turned it back to them. And I said, OK, let's start tomorrow. This is your school. What should we do first? What do you think? Like, where are the opportunities? And they said, well, we just repaved our basketball court but we haven't painted any lines on it yet. So what could we do there? And so then we started talking about, OK, basketball, counting points, math is a really um, intuitive opportunity there. And that's when the teachers started talking about fractions and how hard fractions are. I actually came thinking I was going to work with the kindergarten and preschool teachers. But um, the, the teachers that showed up were older uh, primary school teachers, and they wanted to talk about fractions. And so I said, all right, let's do it. Let's talk about fractions. And so eventually we came up with this design that I explained and the number line. And we created a series of games, scripted games. And so um, I want to just briefly call back something from the minister's um, um, speech this morning talking about um, play. And uh, we know that play is a powerful mechanism for learning, but it doesn't mean that just send kids off to play on their own and all of a sudden they're just going to learn everything they need to know. It has to be guided play or playful learning, scaffolded with a specific learning goal. If you want kids to learn fractions, you have to design a play context that's going to help them learn fractions, right? And so in this case, we've, scaffold, we've scaffolded um, the environment through physically, through the design of the court, and by working with teachers to support these, um, the, uh, these games. Uh, and so the first game is called Rapid Fire. This is all the kids' favorite game. And this is each kid gets 30 seconds and they, to make as many baskets as you can. And it's just a free-for-all. 
Um, another game is called Naked Cows. So this time, each team gets a certain preset number of shots. Your team gets 10 shots. My team gets 10 shots. And so beginning, they're just taking whatever shots they want. But as you get closer to your end, if I'm at three and a half, and you're at two and, two and three quarters, and there's only two shots left, but you better be mindful about which two shots you take if you want to catch up, right? So it takes a little bit more planning. It slows the pace down a little bit. Um, and then this game exactly is when there's an exact goal. So the winner is not the one who gets the most points, but the one who gets to exactly three and a quarter, let's say. And so again, as you approach your goal, you have to slow down and say, okay, I'm at 2.75. I need 3.25. If I take a whole point shot, I'm going to lose because I passed up my goal. So you have to slow down and um, engage in some more um, critical thinking. Um, and so um, we've done uh, uh, exper uh, several experimental studies evaluating the impacts of fraction ball on kids' um, rational number learning, fraction and decimal learning. And the long story short, kids learn a lot of fractions when they play this game. So that's very exciting. And uh, it makes a lot of sense, but it's really nice to have evidence, rigorous evidence that this is an effective tool. So again, thinking about oh, you know, I need to prepare my kids for, that primary, for those primary grades because you know, when they really need to learn stuff, you know, we got to leave the play behind and we got to let them you know, do workshops or do worksheets or you know, whatever people do. Uh, the play uh, and the playful learning works uh, for older kids and, and adults uh, as well. Um, and so, but we didn't stop there. Um, we took these results, which were initially encouraging results, and um, we got a, uh, a grant to work with the Santa Ana Unified School District and to partner with their teachers and students um, to grow the curriculum even more and connect it back to the classroom. So teachers told us, yes, playing on the court is awesome. The kids learn. But I do need some instructional time in the classroom to really dive into some of these deeper concepts. And so we worked with teachers to create new activities and new lessons in the classroom. Um, and, but we kept the playful uh, spirit. So we have kids watching LA Sparks and LA Laker games, professional basketball, and then pausing after made baskets and saying, okay, what would that shot have been worth on a fourth court or a third court or, or an eighth court, right? Or have we, ha we had kids start collecting data out on the court when they're playing fraction ball and then bringing that data back into the classroom to analyze it and add up their points and saying, where are we getting our points from? You know, I noticed that we're scoring all of our points from the quarter or half point mark, and we take shots from the whole point mark, but nobody makes them because we can't make those shots. So should we be taking them? So again, analyzing their data to make strategy decisions about the next time they go play. And so we did another experiment. We got even bigger impacts, bigger, even bigger findings, and uh, kids learned in almost everything we measured. Um, but the one thing they weren't learning on was the, uh, the court, the more advanced mathematics that wasn't represented on, the, represented on the court, like adding unlike denominators, like fourths plus eighths, or thirds plus sixths, or finding common denominators, because it wasn't part of the game. It makes sense that they wouldn't really learn that. And so this time, we challenged students. And we, we went uh, and, uh, to, um, to work with an all-girls after-school engineering club called the Femineers. And the Femineers were uh, sixth, fifth, sixth, and seventh grade girls. And these two brilliant young ladies um, came. Uh, the, whole, the whole group came, but these two had a home run idea. Um, and they came per, to campus to present to a panel of faculty and, and doctoral students and their idea. And they got up. And, and we were in this like, really beautiful maker space that had all this amazing technology and equipment. And they got up there and they said, you know, um, in, in the Femineers, we're very lucky to have access to 3D printers and high-powered computers and all this amazing technology. But actually, for our game, we didn't use any of it. And we didn't use any of it because we know that most kids don't have access to these things that we have access to. And we want any kid to be able to play our game. So for our game, all you need is a paper, a pencil, and a bottle cap. And you can play our game. And so they designed this game that we're calling uh, the bottle cap game. I don't know. We have to think of a better name. If everybody's got a fun name for it, we're open to ideas. Um, but they, they drew the fractions at the end, one quarter, two quarter, three quarter, four. And then you take the bottle cap and you flick it. And it's like a shuffleboard. And then you, you count your points on the number line. So very similar, mirrors the outdoor game. But what's nice about this, because when we brought this back to the teachers, they said, oh, you know, actually, we could use this as an opportunity to have different representations of fractions that it's hard to do out on the court. So we could do, do a bottle cap court that has fourths and eighths right next to it. Or, fourths, thirds, and twelfths. So, because it, it's, again, because it's so brilliant, it just takes paper, pencil. You can make a new board very easily. And so, um, 
we, we integrated this into the classroom um, component of the intervention, and all of a sudden, in only two, two sessions, three sessions, a very short intervention, we saw impacts on, the far, on those FAR transfer items, which is unlike denominators and some of those more advanced concepts. So again, tapping into the brilliance of young people and engaging them in designing um, their own learning spaces to, can create these incredibly powerful learning opportunities. We also made a video game, um, brilliant, another brilliant doctoral student made a video game um, that can be used to reinforce um, these concepts and also as a measure so we don't have to have kids taking you know, boring tests, they can play a video game and we can learn about how much they know. Um, we measured um, kids' motivation and um, what we found is that kids who played fraction ball had more positive emotions towards math and felt less bored during math, so that was very encouraging, I would hope. Um, we also have a whole number version for younger kids. That's basically the same game, but uh, they're doing whole number arithmetic instead of fraction arithmetic, so this would be... Oh, and also we switched it to soccer for the little kids because they had trouble shooting up on the goal, so they just kicked the ball. And uh, Actually, the kids like soccer even better, so we're probably going to do soccer for more. Uh, more. Um, and yeah, the, uh, again, for this project, we're hoping to um, share it with the world. So already, um, we have, uh, I have a colleague from Kosovo who, has done, who did fraction ball. Uh, these are kids in the Netherlands playing the soccer version. Um, and, you know, unless you speak Dutch, you probably don't know what they're saying, but you can hear the enthusiasm in their voice. This is math class for fourth and fifth grade students. And so, uh, you know, it's embodied, it's playful. Uh, why can't school look like that, you know? Uh, and these kids are in, uh, in Kosovo. This is the first indoor court. It's kind of loud. I'll, I'll cruise through. Um, anyways, the Kosovo video, the kids, somebody hits a game-winning shot and the kids go bananas. Pretty awesome. So, and again, joyful, fun, this is how learning should be. Um, I just want to take a minute to say that this work doesn't happen without big teams. And so I uh, just want to acknowledge um, my colleagues and collaborators, um, the students, um, our funders, and our community organizations. Um, it, it takes a, a big group to, to make these kinds of things happen. Um, and I want to officially um, invite everybody here to join the Playful Learning Landscapes movement and bring these um, joyful learning experiences to your classrooms and your community. Um, I, I have, uh, I should have put the website, playfullearninglandscapes.org uh, or .com or .fun. I think they all work. We bought them up, all of them, just because why not? Um, to check out, uh, uh, these um, projects are happening um, all over the United States. Uh, there's been projects in South Africa. Um, there's uh, a project in Italy. There's, anyways, we're, we're looking for, for a global reach, and I'm super excited to be here and to share with y'all and to hear how um, this movement and initiative would transform as it comes to Singapore and it comes to the, the, the children and families that you all work with. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's what we'll be doing this afternoon. We'll be creating um, learning landscapes. You all will be creating learning landscapes, and I'm super excited to see how it all goes. And again, um, Thank you to Serene and, and SUSS folks uh, for inviting me out, and it was a real pleasure.